thank you to all of you for your wondrous support as always on my crash team racing review leave your comments down below if you'd like to be featured once again in my next video and i'd like to give a special thank you to my lovely patron stin Dotman and Bapelli. I hope you guys are enjoying your Patreon perks and I hope you all enjoy the video. Jack 1 was great. At this point, however, with the Crash Trio and now the Precursor Legacy, Naughty Dog has kind of beat that style of platformer into the ground. So it'll be very interesting to see where Naughty Dog goes with a sequel. Oh, Jesus shit, more dicks, no! Well, we're jumping right into the action, aren't we? With our hero stranded in Timbuk fuck after falling through this rift that was actually what was foreshadowed at the end of the last game. That's nice. Jack gets clocked in the dome and fast forward two years is getting juiced up with Dark Eco. Luckily, Daxter arrives to rescue his best buddy, but unfortunately, as we know, Jack isn't the best at showing his gratitude since he can't talk. I'm gonna kill Praxis! Oh, his first words. I'll kill him! In all seriousness, this is a really great moment with Jack's first words firmly establishing how much he truly hates Baron Brown. What did you say, punk? And it's also a peek at his new rugged personality. Okay, wow, I was not ready for today. Well, at least Daxter's still ready to be a wise ass. What the heck was that? Sheesh. Remind me not to piss you off. I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now, and well, that's just how this game is. The story is cranked up to 1,000, and of all the games I've played so far, has easily the most complex one. So let's break it down. Jack and Daxter have basically been transported through this portal to the distant future. But they don't know that yet. <laughs> they ask this geezer core and his brat where the hoot they are, and he informs them that they have been invited to Baron Praxis's birthday party with warm milk and cookies. Just kidding, they're gonna die. After thrashing some of the Baron's crimson guards with your new edgy powers. That was cool! Do it again. Who advises that they seek out the Shadow, the leader of an underground group waging war against Haven City's Baron Praxis. The duo head off to find one of the group's lead coordinators, Torn, and he sends them off on a mission to steal Praxis's banner to prove their worth to the cause. As you'd expect, of course, everything went smoothly and according to plan. <laughs> No, seriously, he let us in. In this new installment, things have clearly undergone quite an overhaul. Between Jack's redesign, which I love, mm, tall, dark, and gruesome, and him now being able to speak, speak. I will kill Chris. Good boy. The less vibrant, more dystopian setting, which of course fits thematically with the darker plot, the techno interface accompanied by a map and mission based structure, etc. Missions have more incentive and authenticity to them now, like they have real weight and consequences. Everything you do feels like it's contributing to something and making a difference. It's all incredibly different from Jack One's more primitive, lively approach, for a lack of a better term, while also remaining very familiar and feels like a completely natural progression from its predecessor. I was totally fine with how Jack One did things since the game was just so sad satisfying and fun to play, but brownie points go to Jack 2 in this regard, because this is way better than My boy, I've got a power cell for you. In exchange, of course, for perhaps fetching your dear uncle uh can of Gucci. In a majority of these missions, you'll be blitzing your way through metalheads, which are these biomechanoid creatures that the Baron is at war with. Missions include restoring water to the slums, <laughs> destroying all the ammo in the Baron's fortress, <laughs> while on the mission to destroy all that precious ammo, the duo see some of Praxis's guards exchanging barrels of eco with metalheads, even though they're supposed to be at war. We've been we report back to Torn, and Torn orders the two to drive across town to make a delivery of eco ore to this... <laughs> Well, fat fuck is about as nice as I can put it. And try to pry some information out of this guy crew as well, since he may have some inside knowledge as to what the Baron's up to. Haven City is pretty crowded to drive around. It's not horrible, but you'll definitely be accidentally bumping into other cars and pedestrians quite a bit. Granted, I was still getting used to the controls at this point since this is my first playthrough, but yeah. Hopefully driving across town doesn't happen too frequently. <laughs> Yeah, guess what? That's exactly what happens. You constantly have to drive back and forward, back and forward, and I'm sick of it! There's many, many missions where you have to drive across the entire town, which takes like two to three minutes each time. And when you take into account how many missions there are, yeah, that's a lot of time just tediously flying around. At the very least, they do include side missions for you to tackle, but uh... Fuck you! Yeah, I personally don't really care about these side missions. For completing side missions, you get precursor orbs, which are now much rarer than they were in Jack 1. And they're used to unlock cheats, so that's pretty neat, but unfortunately, I just don't have the time to devote to that jazz. But I do have time to blow shit up! Continuing to stray away from the traditional platformer style of spins and kicks, the main method of combat has now evolved into gunplay, thanks to crew gifting us the morph gun, and I love it! What's really awesome about the morph gun is that it has four different modes, hence the name, all of which are powered by different forms of eco. The red scatter mod acts as a shotgun based on the more potent attack ability you were granted by red eco in Jack 1. The yellow blaster mod, which is inspired by the fireballs from Jack 1, acts like a semi-automatic rifle and can do this. The blue Vulcan fury mod, god that's 
cool name. It's based on your supercharged abilities previously granted by Blue Eco and acts like a fully automatic rifle. Finally, there's the Peacemaker, which is powered by Dark Eco and... Yeah, I think it speaks for itself. With the complete tone shift that this series has taken with this entry, it was necessary that Jack needed to take things up a notch from Karate. And this is perfect. You only start off with the scatter gun, but as the game progresses, the other modifications will be implemented and you'll even receive upgrades such as a faster rate of fire and more ammo. You'll receive plenty of these upgrades from crew working for him as a wastelander, which is basically someone who scavenges supplies for him beyond the city's walls. Crew is honestly one of the most captivating characters I've ever seen in like anything. His design is so memorable, all he cares about is weapons and making money since, well, he's a smuggler, weapons dealer, bar owner, crime lord, you get the gist. He just has such an aura about him to me, I I don't know, he just really piques my interest. The characters in Jack 2 as a whole are just so fucking good. And again, I already was cool with what we had in Jack 1. Before doing a job for crew in the sewers to destroy sentry guns to clear crew's old smuggling route, Jack once again demands an explanation as to why the Baron's forces are seemingly trading with metalheads. Crew angrily explains that the Baron supplies them with eco shipments so long as they attack the city just enough to keep Praxis in power, distracting the general public from the Baron's corrupt politics. However, Praxis is running short on eco and of course he needs to keep this deal going for the reasons I just mentioned. After clearing out the sewer, Crew has yet another proposition for our two heroes as he wants them to race for one of his clients. He's now I've already aged 15 years driving back and forth across this city. Also, I have to mention this game is so funny. I love its humor so much. I've uh, already you signed your name to save time. Hmm? We the racers hereby agree to give crew all proceeds from race earnings, endorsement fees, broadcast royalties, syndication residuals, vehicle sponsorships, small appearance fees, collectible card assets, fast food tie-ins, use of likeness rights, talk show deals, clothing lines, all print rights. Anyway, that client just so happens to be former love interest Kira, who doesn't recognize Jack's voice because, well, he's never talked. She tells you to fuck off and do some flips, and then she's like, fine, oh, I'll help oh. you, you stupid elf, and points you in the direction of where to turn on an elevator to get to the Baron's palace. The duo rescue this scientist Vin from under Metalhead Siege and Daxter just loves triggering his PTSD from it. Ah! A metalhead behind you! After doing some other crap, they ask him to turn on that elevator's power. And we're all set now, so let's see. The elevator is up and to the left. Okay, got it. The elevator leads straight up to the very top of the city, accompanied by a bit of classic platforming. You reach the roof of the palace and eavesdrop on the Baron and the Metalhead leader, continuing their fallout due to no eco supply on the Baron's end, and that bonehead Daxter almost blows their cover, but luckily they're not spotted, and never mind, our cover's blown. Unlike the bosses from Jack 1, which were pretty decent, these bosses will completely blow you to bits. The Baron uses what I like to think is this Cthulhu-inspired mech, but the wiki weakly refers to it as a squid mech. How boring is that? He starts off with some high rate of fire laser, which sent me into a bit of a panic at first, but wasn't all bad once I got the hang of it. Next round, he shoots Blue Eco rockets, which are actually pretty easy to evade. And in the third round of the fight, he fires off Red Eco tornadoes and absolutely bulldozes you. Once he uses up all his ammo, he has to recharge, which is another opening to attack. And once you get a third of his health down, he'll spiral out of control. And if you let your guard down, it'll definitely cost you. He also has about a five second invincibility buff after each bit of damage he receives, but no, we don't get that. This game has to be hard. Pull that all together and you've got a really great, challenging boss battle with an amazing soundtrack to boot. Speaking of the music, one thing that's cool as well is when you pull out the morph gun, the music alters slightly. The game also does this when you hijack a hover car or use your hoverboard, and yeah, I just love little attention to detail like this. On the flip side to that, while I assume this is just an issue with the HD collection, there were quite a few times, mostly towards the end of the game, where the music just cuts out. Oh yes, I'm really getting the adrenaline rush I need to mud stomp this asshole. And from here on out, your asshole is gonna be getting mud stomped, because this game is the literal definition of difficulty spot. There's this mission at the water slums where you have to get this piece of a seal for a lurker because they're good guys now, lol. <laughs> and you get ambushed by Crimson Guards. I got stuck on this for an hour. Or how about this mission where you have to escort other members of the underground in new safe houses because you cause too much of a ruckus at the Baron's Palace and you're getting your shit kicked in by Crimson Cars the whole time. The guys are pussies who just die from love taps and you die just from trying to park your car. Or even this mission, which is way harder than it probably should have been. I mean, just look at my nose where you have to destroy this equipment using your jet board at the Baron's excavation site while guards are equipped with China Lakes and your jet board won't attach to the fucking wheel. Not to mention the 
the checkpoints can be unforgiving. I just got set back like seven minutes after escorting these dumb snotty losers through the stinky sewer. They're not even helpful. Like, you're useless. Let's talk about someone much less useless. That person being Ashlyn, the daughter of the Baron. Corn sent us out to look for her at the pumping station, and she suggests that you ask the old soothsayer Onan and her interpreter Pecker about artifacts related to Mar. Mar being the legendary precursor founder of Haven City. She goes on to inform you of the tomb of Mar, which is home to the precursor stone, and the stone is the key to defeating the metalheads once and for all. Onan says they need to retrieve not two, not four. Three. Artifacts from the Precursor Mountain Temple outside the city. The Mountain Temple is one of the only places in the game which seems mostly untouched by civilization, with it and Haven Forest being the only places really reminiscent of the more natural environments from Jack 1. It's a really, really cool setting with some fun puzzle segments to mix things up. And it's nice to take a step back from all the chaos we've endured so far and ease into something a bit more back to basics, even though these guys are assholes. Then the game continues to cram me into my duffel after Torn sends the pair out to protect the sacred site, and they realize that said site is actually. Samus's hut, which is now completely overgrown, and the two realize that they're in the future. Well, the future, who would have thought that? After returning to the hideout, we finally meet the Shadow, who's actually a young Samos. And he informs us that the kid we've seen throughout the game with Kor is actually an heir to the throne of Mar, meaning he is the only one who can open the tomb of Mar to get the precursor stone. We take the young laddie to the tomb after recovering all the other necessary supplies to access the tomb's entrance, but an oracle informs us that he's too much of a wuss to take on the obstacles that lie inside, so Jack goes in instead. After traversing all of the tomb's trials like more puzzles and even a throwback to the chasing days of Crash Bandicoot, Baron Praxis re-emerges in an attempt to retrieve the stone and so we have to whoop his hiney again. He sends these bots after you and then shoots these bombs that you have to whack back towards him. In the final third of the fight, he actually gets a hold of the stone and harnesses its power to destroy the platform around you. And he also sometimes gets all close and personal, firing quickly at you and destroying the pillars or jacked his shields for you. Not as good as the first fight, but still pretty enjoyable. Praxis escapes with the stone, and Torn confesses that he had to sell out the underground to protect Ashlyn, as Praxis threatened to kill her for treason since she had been working as an underground spy. After rescuing our rebellious buddies from the fortress where Jack was formerly imprisoned, we're reunited with our Samos, and he he instructs us to find the life seed from his hut, which will grant the younger Samus the same sagely power as his older counterpart. Jack and Daxter deliver the seed to Samus Jr., and he uses it to talk with the plants or some shit about what will happen in the future. And the plants reveal to him that the Baron plans to break the stone, releasing his power in an attempt to rid the world of metalheads for good. Which, you know, works all fine and dandy, because it would also destroy the entire world. <laughs> Meanwhile, Kira has been secretly working on a replica of the same Rift Rider that sent them to this time period to get them back to their native timeline, though she still needs the time and the heart of Mar, and the latter of which is in Crew's possession. That fuck probably ate it already. But no time for that now, as it's time for the championship race against this prick who's been simping our girl and apparently us too. Ooh. But we pulverize his arse with ease, winning ourselves the tour of Praxis's palace. Of course, Praxis recognizes us, but definitely not fast enough, because he had no clue who we were at first. I mean, crikey, you've tried killing Jack twice, and before that, Jack was your dark warrior experiment for two years, dumbass. He sends his goons on a headhunt for us, but not before Errol fucking dies. The guards kill us and then everything's fine. Like nothing ever happened. Also, I know I haven't said anything really about the races up to this point, even though there's been like three of them before this. They're fine, you boost, you drive, it controls fine, so yeah. I'd much rather talk about how fast this woman.png in the crowd is clapping. Or how fast this dumb broad was convinced. Jack tells her, You did we're gonna die if dickhead dad cracks open that stone! And she's like, nah man, quit busting my stones, we're all good. Then she calls Vin for proof and he's like, And then she's like, oh. Never mind, go kill that two-ton tub of fun who's planning to crack open the stone. Tensions have been slowly boiling between the boys and the behemoth boy pretty much ever since we met crew. And it was made especially obvious that they were going to come to blows eventually when Jack refused to throw in the championship race for him. Crew tries to bribe Jack with one last gun upgrade to simply walk away and forget that we saw him building a bomb to break open the precursor stone, but Jack's not buying it. So now it's time to throw down against these electrified crew clones. Let me introduce you to my crew. Shut the fuck up. I'd advise staying as far back as possible here and fending them off with your scatter gun until you clear the waves of them. After that, crew will come in for the kill, but you should be able to fight him off very easily with either the blaster or Vulcan Fury. This took me a couple tries, but that's really only because I hadn't formulated the scatter strategy up to that point. And once I did, that made this fight fairly easy. But it was still a ton of fun. Fat 
Fuck! Drew activates the bomb he built to break the stone in the last ditch effort to do us in, but Ashlyn is there for the save, and we made it off with the Heart of Mar as well. Then we have to do Whack-A-Mole, because why not? And beating the minigame grants us the time map from inside the machine that Crew was hiding away. But now we have to rescue fellow Wastelander Sig after Crew sent him on a mission to the Underport to open a passage for the Metalheads to infiltrate the city, which of course Sig didn't know that's what he was actually doing. After doing a couple more puzzle segments and being chased by this giant Metalhead, we finally lose him and... Oh no. He's doing the heroic speech thing heroes do before they die. You know that thing where they're like, yup, we're gonna kill him. We're gonna shoot him up dead. Nothing can stop us. <laughs> yup. No way, pal. No, sir. We're gonna... I'm gonna fuck him up good, and he's dead. And soon enough, all these people may be dead, because as we re-emerge to the surface, we see metalheads have completely taken over the streets of Haven City in a full-scale attack. We meet with the others outside the racing stadium, and help escort the now fully constructed Rift Rider to the metalhead nest. And then we finally meet the metalhead leader, who turns out to be Kor. The Baron leads a charge against him, and fails hilariously. The city must die, and we all die! Ah! <laughs> Hey, at least he left me with a nice quote for me to hang on my wall. Finally, with the precursor stone in hand, after retrieving it from that other bomb Praxis had conjured up, we invade the Metalhead Nest. And now, everything is finally starting to come together. With the boy by his side, Kor explains that the boy is actually a younger Jack, and the Jack we know now actually began his journey in the future, where we're at now. So, technically, the precursor legacy actually takes place in the past. And this game takes place in the present? Honey, the more you think about it, the more it hurts the head. Yeah, thank you, Daxter. That sums up my feelings perfectly. The foreshadowing in this game is on point, though, between Kor's eventual reveal as the Metalhead leader. Baron is bribing the Metalheads with Eco. <laughs> it will never be enough. And the boy being revealed as Jack. Find yourself, Jack. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> Interesting. That insufferable mutt never liked anyone but the boy before. I guess I'm just good with animals. The reason the younger Jack is so vital is because he possesses the gift to release the precursor entities from inside the stone. Our Jack doesn't because the dark eco injections over the years have corrupted him. Basically, this stone is actually a precursor egg. The last one, in fact. And Kor wants to feed on this final precursor life force. Kor blasts the edge they're standing on to try and knock the stone away from them. And none other than Dark Jack emerges from the rubble. I'm here for this. Let's fucking go. Oh. I was really hype. I thought we were gonna get straight up Dark Jack versus Core, but Dark Jack is really cool. I wish they did more with him. I mean, the opening cutscene establishes this new freaky power. And shortly after, Jack bursts into it again, going on about how he can't control it. But after that, it's almost like the game forgot about its place in the story, or that it even existed to begin with. Sure, you can upgrade your dark powers using metalhead skulls, but that's really as relevant as the power up becomes. But man, doing this is so fucking cool. No worries though, my disappointment was quickly subsided by what is a fantastic final fight. You've got these metalhead scorpion looking things scanning and all over as Kor charges up some blasts. Once you deal a third of his health, metalheads emerge from the hole below him with jetpacks and after schooling them and thumping Kor some more, he decides it's time to stop messing around and make his way to the ground. That rhymed. This is where things kept getting very intense for me, because by the time I reached this phase of the fight, I was usually very low on ammo. So I'd have to quickly fetch some more from around the arena while he's in hot pursuit of my anus, which was always super nail-biting. Once you're stocked up, he's not too bad, but the tension is real. You should already be dead! At long last, the war with the metalheads is over and a precursor emerges from the egg before leaving through the rift. Using the rider, the gang sends the younger Jack and Seamus back to the precursor legacy timeline, while our current crop of heroes rejoice at Crew's old bar, which has now become the naughty Otzel. But the best part is my man Sig returning from the brink of death! <laughs> and that was the absolute roller coaster known as Jack 2. Good God. God, my head hurts. This game grabbed you by the balls and really reels you in to begin the adventure. Jack opens up with a badass line. He can transform. And let's not forget you've just been thrusted who knows how many years into the future or past or fuck. I love the morph gun and the way they incorporated the different types of eco into it. The bosses were amazing. The music has some gems when it actually played. The characters are incredibly captivating. The game was making me laugh over and over and over again and overall just some 
somehow very naturally progresses from the country setting, as Daxter calls it, to a more gritty dystopian city. Hell, I even relish the challenge of the massive difficulty jump this game takes from its predecessor, because figuring out the correct strategy to approach enemies is so satisfying. What left me unsatisfied, however, which I just mentioned a moment ago, is the fact that Dark Jack doesn't play much of a role in the bigger picture. There's also a mech and it sucks dick. As you play through this game, you'll probably have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it due to the tedious driving around the map, how difficult it can get at times, and the gripes I just mentioned. But the more I find myself dwelling on the adventure now that it's all said and done, the more I just absolutely love it. Jack 2 was an outstanding over- Hey guys, wait your turn! Your video's up next!